Well, good evening, Kairos. It's good to see you guys here tonight. I'm glad you guys all made it through the flood and you have made your way here. My name is Mike. If you haven't met me yet, I'm the Kairos pastor. It's a privilege to be here with you tonight as we study the scriptures. Now, uh, tonight, as we get started, uh, I just want to just say, if you're new, we're really glad that you're here. We believe that God has you here for a reason. We believe that God is doing something special in the hearts and lives of everybody here at Kairos. And tonight, we're going to be wrapping up our study on emotional resilience, how to overcome anxiety and stress and have a life that actually flourishes. So I'm excited to see where God's going to take us tonight. Uh, just kind of an update on where we're going. We're going to look at the text tonight, and then we're going to do something special. We've got a special guest tonight. His name is Dr. Ken Kaur. He's a pastor here in Nashville. He's pastored for over 45 years. He's on staff with us here at Brentwood, and he's going to do some Q&A. He's a family therapist, and we want to hear from you. So I'm going to throw up a number here on the wall, uh, on the screen right here. Uh, this is a number you can text. It isn't somebody's personal cell phone number, just so you know, okay? It will go to a cell phone, but it is not someone's personal number. But you can ask any question that you want of us tonight. So if you're thinking about something as we're talking, as we're preaching the word, as we're discussing things, we want to hear from you. Maybe it's even something that's just kind of coming up with your own life when it comes to anxiety, stress, and depression. Tonight, we've got someone who can really help us out with that. His name is Ken Kaur. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited to see where God's going to take us. Now, uh, tonight, oh, by the way, did we put the number up? Did the number go up? All right. It's right there. Got it. Right here on the wall. I was looking. I was pointing at myself, and I was like, I don't see it on my face. So we're good there. All right. So the number's right behind me. All right. So when I was, uh, when I was somebody who graduated from college, the wheels fell off my life. Like all of a sudden, my life stopped working. I thought I had everything figured out. I had been going to school at Northwestern College in Minneapolis. I was doing well. I was serving in my local church. I was doing all the right things. And all of a sudden, my life came to a screeching halt because everything that I had been working for and everything I'd been hoping for did not happen. So I had a heart for ministry. God called me in the ministry when I was in college. I quit playing football on the football team because I wanted to serve my local church. I did an internship there, started serving every week in the youth ministry, helped start a college ministry. And when I heard that they were going to hire a college pastor, I thought that was my job. I thought I was lined up for it. I started having conversations with leadership. I was like, this is my job. It's going to happen. And I found out that they decided to hire one of my best friends instead. And I was like, are you kidding me? I thought this was my opportunity, but it wasn't. They ended up hiring me a job, but guess what it was? It was cleaning toilets. That was the job they offered me, not being the leader of the college ministry. But instead, it was like, we need a janitor. Can you fill that role? So I didn't have a lot of options. I was like, okay, I'm going to start doing that. I started working as a custodian at my local church. Second thing that happened that summer all my friends got married, except for me. All my best friends got married. Now, my Christian college that I went to, we had a rule. The rule was this. It was a promise that they made to you. It was ring by spring or your money's back, okay? Ring by spring or your money's back. Maybe that's something that was at your school, too. There's this expectation. You go to college, you meet the one, you get married, and you live happily ever after. That was not my story. Instead, I got to go to a lot of very expensive weddings with my friends, and buy a lot of tuxes that summer and celebrate with them all the while I was as single as could be. That was hard to, to go through that that summer. And then the other thing that happens, I felt God calling me to seminary. So after doing the custodial work for a while, I realized, no, I want to I leave this job. I'm going to go do something else. And I decided to leave Minnesota to go to Memphis, Tennessee. I never lived in the South before. I'd never been around Southerners. I'd never heard the word y'all. I'd never had sweet tea. And I said, I don't know what any of that really is going to mean for me, but I feel like God's calling me to seminary. I'm going to go to Memphis. And I left everything I knew. In a lot of ways, it felt like everybody else that I knew was on the highway of life. They're on the interstate of life. They're going 80 miles an hour in a certain direction. I was taking an off-ramp to nowhere. And I realized, looking back, that I was angry. I was angry 
at God because he didn't answer all the prayers that I was praying. I was angry at my situation. I was frustrated because I felt that I had been playing by the rules and things weren't working out. And I don't know where you are tonight, but you might feel the exact same way. You might be feeling like you're doing the right things, you're trying to be a good person, and things aren't working out. There might be people in your life that have betrayed you. They've gone behind your back. They've had opportunities you haven't been able to have yet. And you want them, and because you're not walking in them, you're feeling anxiety because you're not keeping up or you're feeling betrayal, or you're feeling hurt because you're not getting what you were expecting. And looking back at that moment in my life, now with the perspective that I have, because my life has moved on, I feel incredible gratitude for what God was doing. Because perspective is a funny thing. Perspective gives us a way of seeing the world in ways that we couldn't when we were in the moment. And right now, I'm so glad I don't live in Minnesota, okay? Every day in February, I go, thank God I did not get that job because it is minus 17 right now in Minneapolis, Minnesota, okay? I even keep their, uh, their, the, the zip code to where I went to school on my phone so I can look at it and go, thank God I'm not there, okay? Because there's something powerful about being in Nashville is that We get these weeks where it's like 70 degrees and it's no longer winter for at least a week or two. It just feels incredible, right? I also am so grateful that God did not allow me to get married and live in Minnesota because my wife lived in Memphis. I never would have met Tabitha, the love of my life, if I had settled for that job because God had something better. Perspective is powerful. And it's hard to get. It's hard to get perspective. It's really hard to get it in the moment because all we see are the obstacles in front of us. But tonight, I want to call us to a different kind of perspective than simply looking back at our past from where we are. I want to move perspective from being something on a human level to being a divine perspective. I want to talk about providential perspective. Now, you may say, what is providence? What is providential? That sounds like a very Christian word, doesn't it? It's not a word that you would use very often, the word providence, but it's an important word for us if we want to understand the Bible. So I'm going to define it. Wayne Grudem, who's a systematic theologian, defines providence, specifically God's providence, as this, that God is continually involved with all created things in such a way that he, number one, keeps them existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them. Number two, cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do. And number three, directs them to fulfill his purposes. Now, that's a lot. So I would just define it as this. Providence means God's in charge, okay? Providence means that God has a plan, and he's going to do it. That he knows the future, he knows the present, and he knows the past, and he knows what is best, and he has the power to accomplish whatever he wants to do. And this idea of providence gives us confidence in the moments that we are currently facing. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to look at the scripture, we're going to be looking at Joseph's life. We've been walking through the story of, of Joseph every week for the last several weeks. We've been looking at Joseph's life, and we're going to be looking at how he understands providence, because providence provides perspective. That's our bottom line for tonight. Providence provides perspective, and it's my hope that as you see God's providence, the way that Joseph saw God's providence, that you will be free to walk confidently in what's ahead of you. So let's look at the text. If you guys have a copy of the scriptures, why don't you open it with me to Genesis chapter 45. We're going to start in verse 3. It says this, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. 
Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now, our story is, is the culmination of everything we've been seeing over the last several weeks. And just to catch you up, if you haven't been here, Joseph was a son in his father's household. He was the favorite son of 12 other brothers. And these brothers hated him because his dad liked him more than everybody else. And they decided to sell him into slavery. And so Joseph gets sold into slavery. They tell his father that he is dead. And Joseph lands in a country called Egypt. In slavery, he then is betrayed by his master's wife. She tells lies about him, and he gets thrown into prison. So it goes from bad to worse. And in prison, he meets a couple people who have dreams. He interprets their dreams and says, hey, listen, if you ever get out, please don't forget me, which they promptly did. They're like, ah, who's that guy? But one day, Pharaoh, who's the king of Egypt, has a dream. No one can interpret it. And one of the people that was in the prison with Joseph goes, hey, I know a guy who understands dreams. And so they bring Joseph to Pharaoh. Joseph interprets the dream. And Pharaoh says, the dream is so important because it was a dream telling them that there was going to be a famine coming. We're going to elevate you to be the ruler over the entire land of Egypt. So no longer are you a slave, no longer you're a prisoner. Now you are the ruler of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And so our story picks up there. Joseph has been serving in Pharaoh's court. And as he's serving there, one day his brothers show up because they're hungry. Their food ran out too. And they show up in front of Joseph. Joseph sees them. And in this moment, it's important for us to recognize the pain in the room. Joseph has been carrying the weight of his betrayal since he was sent into slavery. And he's finally face to face with the people who sold him, his brothers. Can you imagine how he's feeling? How would you feel? Have you ever been betrayed? When you see that person, how do you feel? Do you get angry? Do you, do you avoid them? Do you, do you start like wanting to get your revenge upon them? How do you feel when you think about people who've done you wrong? Joseph is face to face with his enemies. And then he tells them who he is. Now, can you imagine being the brothers? They're like, oh no, we thought you were dead. And now you have the power to have your revenge upon us. We are at your mercy. And tonight we're going to see two major decisions that you're going to find in this text. And the first one is this. The first one is that every single one of us have a choice of revenge or release. Revenge or release. You see, hurt can be a chain that binds us. It binds us with a lock of pain. It keeps us captive. We can become people who are owned by the hurt that others have inflicted upon us. It lives rent-free in our head. And Joseph has a de decision to make. What is he going to do with his brothers? He can either have his revenge upon them or he can release them from it. And I want you to see what Joseph says. This is incredibly powerful. When I read this for the first time as I was preparing for this message, I actually began to, to be very tearful as I started hearing these words. I began to feel an emotional response to what Joseph says. Joseph says this to the people who hated him. He says, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. Joseph had a secret, and the secret is this. Freedom is found in forgiveness. He could have punished them for what they did, but instead, he released them. And he says, don't be upset with yourself 
for what you did. Because he had a perspective that was bigger. He roots this not simply because Joseph is kind and he wants to be free from the pain of his past. He roots it in God's providence because providence provides perspective. He says the reason why is because God sent him. He expands on this idea in verses 7 and 8. He says this. He says, God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Therefore, it was not God, not you who sent me here, but God. Joseph understands that he was not sold, he was sent. Everybody else saw that he was sold. His value was 20 pieces of silver. That's all his life was worth. But on his worst day, the worst day of his life, was actually the very first day that God was going to tell his story. And God was doing something powerful in Joseph's story to bring him to a place where he would provide for his entire family. And the worst thing that his brothers ever did was actually the first step in God providing for their entire community. In fact, this is what Joseph says later in Genesis 50, verse 20. He says, you planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. So even though they planned evil, God used that for good. That's pretty heavy, right? It's hard to see how God could do anything good from the most painful parts of our life. But God takes the hardest parts of our story and rewrites them into good things. So Joseph is free because he's actually able to release them instead of take revenge on them. So that's the first thing. The second thing we find is that there's a choice that we have, the choice of receiving or rejecting forgiveness. So in this story, there's something that's really incredible. The, the thing that's fascinating about this story is that often we read stories like this and we put ourselves in the place of the main character, right? We're like, I'm Joseph. Ever read that, right? You're like, me, I've been hurt, I am Joseph. We this most of the stories of the Bible that we read. We, we put ourselves in the place of the main character, probably because we see ourselves as the main character in our own story. I don't know if your story, it's a romantic comedy or a tragedy. You know, I don't know if you see yourself as the action hero or the, the, the outsider. I don't know what you see yourself in your story. But most of the time when we read a story, we put ourselves in the place of the main character. And that's okay. And that's actually a good thing. It's good to identify with the, the main character of the story. But in this story, we find that Joseph isn't just any story. Joseph is actually a picture of Jesus. If you look at the Old Testament, there are two main people that give us a picture of the coming king, Jesus Christ. The first one is King David, and the second is Joseph. In fact, those are the two of the names that Jesus is known by. He's known as the son of David and also the son of Joseph. And so if Jesus is, is actually uh, referenced here through Joseph's, uh, Joseph's life as someone who suffers to provide salvation for his people... I think it's important for us to center ourselves not as Joseph, but as the brothers. Have you ever thought that you were the brother in the story? You show up, you've hurt your brother. You've betrayed him. You've lied about him. You've covered it up. And now you're face to face with the worst thing that you've ever done. And here we find something incredibly powerful and freeing is that the same words that Joseph says to his brothers are said to us. Hear, hear what the word of God says about those who are betrayers of their brother, the one who gives himself for them. It says this, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. The New Testament says it like this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, I think sometimes when we think about 
pain and hurt, we think about only the pain and hurt that's been done to us, but to be really honest, all of us have hurt other people. We may, may not have meant it. We may have not meant to say the things that we did. We may look back and cringe over our stories or interactions with people that we've loved or people we've gone on dates with or people who've been our roommates or our friends. And we look back and we say, we wish we could have done that differently. And when we look at our stories, sometimes we wonder, like, how could I even release myself of that guilt? But what we find here is we find a picture of the gospel is that God does not look at our guilt when it comes to our relationship with him. He asks us to give us that pain because he's the only one who can carry it. And the gospel tells us that we can't ever be good enough to be free of that pain and that guilt. We simply must give it to the one who actually can provide salvation and healing, which is Jesus Christ. So I know some of us are carrying weight tonight. It may be bringing us to a place of despair or a lack of hope. And I want you to hear this. Jesus sees it, and he's not afraid of it. He knows it, and he's not running away from you because he believes and he knows that he would go to any length to bring you home. Now, I think bringing this message home, probably the best thing for us to do is to bring Dr. Ken up onto the stage right now, okay? And as we do this, again, I want you guys to interact with this. Like, I think that all of us are carrying weight. We have people who we've hurt or we've been hurt by. But I think it would be very helpful for us to talk through some of these issues together. So please send us messages. It's, it's, it's uh, completely confidential. We do not know who's sending these messages up. We don't know who's behind those phones or what's going on in your story. But tonight, if you have a question, I would love for you to send it in. So, Dr. Ken, thank you for being here. I am honored to be here, especially on a night like tonight, because I know that when you looked at the weather, you had to make a decision, and you're here because you wanted to be here. So, good for you. All those other people didn't want to be here. This is where you want me? Yep. All right. So let me introduce Cameron to you. Cameron's one of our team members here. Cameron's going to be fielding those questions for you. Uh, so he's going to be our proxy on that. And there are some great ones so far. Awesome. I'm excited for that. All right. So as you're kind of looking those, in, uh, looking those up, uh, I have a question. Can I start? Would you, would you give me the, the opportunity to ask a first question? So one of the things we've been talking about a lot here in this series, as we talk about emotional resilience, and as we talk about being people who are able to bounce back when life gets really hard, one of the hardest parts is reconciliation with our story. You know, one of the things that's difficult is to, to move on from painful things and even forgive other people. So, uh, Ken, you've been, you're not only a pastor, you're also a counselor, right? And uh, you do a lot of counseling. And one of the things that you, you do is you walk with people as they look to reconcile past hurt, both in their story and with other people. Uh, so one of the questions I have for you is, what, do you, what advice would you give to us as we, as we talk through reconciliation and the process of doing that healthy? Because there are pitfalls when it comes to reconciling with people. Yeah, let me say that if you've been wounded and you're at a place where you're wondering why that happened to me, you are not alone. Everybody is wounded. Uh, I often have people who show up in my office for counseling for some reason or other, needing healing, and it's not unusual for someone to say to me, I'm just broken, aren't I? Hmm. And my response is, you're not broken, but you are wounded, which means there can be some healing but there are gonna be some scars. And how we move forward out of that healing can be very critical to the way that you move either in, towards growth or towards regression. Mm -hmm. And I think God always wants us to move towards growth. So when you think about reconciliation, number one, just know that you're not alone. You're, everybody's dealing with some form of hurt, woundedness, betrayal, I like that word. Uh, remember this, there 
can be forgiveness without reconciliation. There cannot be reconciliation without forgiveness. So the first thing you have to work on is the peace of forgiving. Whether they will receive that or not, you can't control that. But that's what you've got to work on. And I would say to you that the first part of that is learning to forgive yourself. What part did I have in all of this? And can I get to the place where I'm no longer struggling with my own sense of shame or my own sense of failure? Um, I, I think there's a big difference between guilt and shame, and that is guilt means I did something, I was wrong, I acknowledge the wrong, I can make amends. Shame is I am wrong and there's nothing I can do about that. And I think that one of the perspectives, and I, I like this idea of perspective that you had tonight, Mike, I think one of the perspectives is, where is God in your story? Uh, is there a God that is somehow working with you to bring you to a different place or do you feel totally abandoned? Mm -hmm. And if you can get to the place where you have a God perspective, I don't know necessarily how God is working through this. I don't know what God is doing. But in the Joseph story, that was the thing that kept him through all those years of betrayal. And it was betrayal after betrayal. Started with the brothers, then the, the wife, mm -hmm. and then the guys in the prison who did forget him for two years. Uh, he had to go through betrayal after betrayal. Then you have to think, what's the theology that sustained him? through all of that. At what point did he not just give up and say, obviously God has abandoned me too. So he had a divine perspective, a sense of transcendence that helped him to go through trauma into some type of traumatic growth and not regression. So I think that's what you want to do. We've all made mistakes. We've all been, I, I like the way that you acknowledge that too tonight, Mike. We've all been there. We've all been the brothers at some point in our lives. And being able to recognize that, know yourselves well, uh, and then from that, learn. We don't want to spend a lot of time grieving over past mistakes, but you want to hold on to those past mistakes so that you can learn from them and not do them again. Mm. So I hope that's helpful. It really is. Because a lot of times, the way that we process the past determines the way that we interact with our future. We really can become captive to the moments that really defined us in the past. We say, I'm only that. And, and we can trap ourselves there and not ever move past it to a place that God wants us to walk into. But when we have that perspective, we go, who, who has God really said that I am? Who has he declared that I am? How has he walked with me in the past through every one of the circumstances? Then we can find freedom and the courage to move forward into the future. Exactly. I will tell you this. Hope is the ability to imagine a better future, regardless of the past. If you get stuck in the past, we refer to that as nostalgia. And some people can't get beyond their high school years. Uh, either their successes of their high school years, they'll it'll never be as good as that, or their failures of the high school years. We also find that with senior adults, a lot of senior adults get stuck in depression because they can't see or imagine a better future. Mm -hmm. Their best is behind them. Well, in some cases, that may be true. They may not have the same physical abilities they had when they were 35. But there are other things they have now. They have wisdom now that they didn't have before. So just the ability to imagine a better future gives you a hope and your ability to prospect a better future. Now, let me give you an example of this. Regardless of what you're facing, you don't know what the outcome is going to be, what tomorrow is going to look like but you're telling yourself a story about what that's gonna look like right now. Oftentimes, we imagine the worst. We're already telling ourselves, this is gonna be bad, it's not gonna happen, uh, God's not gonna answer this prayer. Mm -hmm. Where does that story come from? There's a negativity bias that most of us have. We see the, the bad thing. You also have the ability to look at that same story and imagine the best. And why don't we tend to change the story? You can actually rewrite that story of what you're imagining the future's going to look like because we don't know. So just begin to give God what you want it to look like and then live through it. That's cool. Now, not everybody, you know, when you, I, I have had three conversations within the last one week from today to last Monday. I've had three conversations with suicidal people. 
One of those persons said to me, I don't want to hear anybody else ever say to me, it's going to be okay. That becomes cliché-ish. Cliche I don't want to say it's going to be okay because I don't know what your story is going to be. I will go back and say what you said to, tonight, Mike. God is in control. And sometimes the story doesn't end even the way God wants it to because we are sinners and we fall short. But even when we fall short, God is still in control. There is still a God story being told. Mm. And I think that's what you want to ha hold on to. So as you are projecting or prospecting your future, it's just as easy. My daddy used to say, it's just as easy to laugh as it is to cry. So it's just as easy to tell yourself a positive outcome as it is to tell yourself a negative outcome and just trust it. Yeah. All right. So, um, this is a really helpful. It's helpful to hear it. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, Dr. Ken was one of the people I really re researched this series with and just kind of was like, hey, help me process some of the stuff we're working through in this series. And so now it'd be really cool to hear from some of you. Cameron, you got some of the questions? I do. There are so many questions. And so if we do not get to yours, I apologize, but hopefully we can, we can get a couple really good answers. Uh, so. I think this one's really helpful uh, when it comes to reconciliation um, because reconciliation can be such a, uh, an uncomfortable topic because of the myriad of things that need to be reconciled. So in those situations, where is, or what is a good metric for when to forgive and when to seek reconciliation? And uh, I think if, if it feels like a dangerous situation for a person that can't be trusted again, how do you go about reconciliation? Yeah, wow. Reconciliation actually begins with trust because trust has been violated. And so that's one of the things you're going to work on. And I will tell you this, trust has to be earned. They, if a person has not been trustworthy, then they have to earn trust back. Now, that's assuming they want you in their lives. Part of reconciliation, when I said there can be forgiveness without reconciliation, there may be people who have hurt you and they meant to hurt you, and they mean you ill, and they don't want you in their life. Mm. And you would be naive if you simply came, came back into that relationship. You may be setting yourself up for hurt again. So trust becomes critical. So what you, I think you have to do is, begin as you're working through the forgiveness stage, uh, the first step in forgiveness is being able to acknowledge how angry you really are, how hurt you really are, and then you work from there. And, and God has to heal some of that anger and woundedness to get you that place where you're willing to go to that person and you begin with small steps in trusting again. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I, I have worked with many couples who have dealt with infidelity and uh, in that process, let's say the husband was the one who was not faithful and that's not always, not always true, so I'm not blaming all you guys, but that's just for the sake of tonight, say the husband was the one who was unfaithful, he wants her to trust him again, and I will say, well, you'd be pretty naive if you just trusted. You've got to earn trust. Mm -hmm. So part of that is expressing what you need that would be trustworthy. So as an example, I remember one, this guy was, the relationship started with texting this woman on the phone. And she said, well, one of the things I would need for trust to begin to build again I need you to be totally open about your phone. Now, if he says, no, you're never seeing my phone again, that's mine, I, I, you just have to trust me. Well, Not good gonna luck work. with that. <laughs> but you see how that's just a small step, yeah. but you're taking a step toward re-earning that ability to trust and re-earning that ability to be faithful to each other. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's small steps. And even the story of Joseph, it, his, we didn't read the whole text. If you want to do some extra credit reading, go read uh, Genesis 40 through 45. You find Joseph testing his brothers to see if they are trustworthy before he even shows up. So, it, you know, sometimes you look at a very flattened part of the biblical story, like, oh, he just went right to him, so I should do the same thing too. But it's actually the right thing to say, like, can I really trust you? I've forgiven you, but can I really trust you? so we can be fully restored. How yeah, the, the test he actually puts out is, you know, this, this is a blended family. You got Leo's one mother, and you got Rachel was the other mother, and they both have children, so it's a blended family. These are stepbrothers. 
he only has one birth brother, and that is uh, Benjamin. So he sets up a scenario to see if these other brothers will do the same thing to Benjamin they did to him. In other words, have they grown in any way? So I think you do have, that'd be an example there of taking these small steps to learn and re-earn trust. That's great. That's good. Got another one? Yeah, next question, um, I, I think a little bit along similar lines. Um, how do you take practical steps for forgiveness, but specifically forgiveness that lasts? I think we've all encountered moments where we kind of end up going back on our word of, oh yeah, I forgive you. Yeah, there's actually a, a therapeutic process for forgiveness, and it's four steps. First step is deal with your anger. Second step is decide to forgive. There has to be a conscious effort of decision. Am I ready for this or not? And, and uh, there is a, even in this process where you can go back and say, I'm, I'm not quite ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. I thought I was, but I'm not quite ready. But you make a decision. Then you re-engage the, the hurt. You go back and you try to work through what, and by the way, I will tell you this, most relationship wounds have multiple things you've got to grieve. It's not just one thing, but there are several losses here that were involved in that. So you've got to kind of process that. You try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. What were they experiencing when they hurt me? Why would they have done that to me? Can I begin to begin to have some type of empathic understanding of what that failure was all about? So you try to put yourself in, in their shoes. And then the last step would be effort to reconcile, to re-engage. Um, and that every, every one of those are decisions. I might come to the place where all right, I can finally see where they are. I can begin this process of forgiving them and forgiving myself. I don't know that I really want to be reunited or reconciled in terms of being in relationship again. And so I think that there's those kind of practical steps that you walk through. And I would say this too, that we, we've also tended to um, minimize uh, this whole idea of forgiveness and hurt. It, it, is, it is a process that you're gonna go through. It's not just, okay, I decided this morning I'm gonna forgive them mm. and I'm done. Uh, that's probably well, in some ways, you may be repressing what you're really trying to deal with. Now, is it the spiritual thing to forgive? Yeah. Do we want to be spiritual? Yeah. Do we want to be perceived as spiritual? Yeah. But don't short circuit what it really means. I mean, maturity comes at a real price. Yeah. You've got to work through it and just go through the whole process step by step. I would also tell you this, too. It's probably going to be better if you have someone that you can trust that you walk with that process with. Let them kind of guide you. A spiritual director would be perfect. A best friend who's not trying to fix you can be, can be good. A minister may be somebody you can do, but somebody that can listen to you and give you maybe some positive feedback, yeah. maybe to mirror back to you what they're really hearing and, and kind of challenge, am I, am I minimizing this too much? Am I jumping ahead too yeah. quickly? That's good. Um, so we got time for two more questions. Yeah, uh, let's, let's see if we can get as, as many of these into one as possible. Uh, a quick one, maybe, uh, in the meantime. How do you know when you found the right counselor or therapist? That's a great question. How do you know when you found, well, did you come see me? <laughs> <laughs> He's good, guys. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is imperative that you have rapport. Now, what I would tip, tell you is, if after the very first meeting you walk away and you say, boy, that guy or that gal was goofy. They're not for you. Don't stay with them if you feel that way at all. It's like going what, on a first date. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But now let me, let me tell you this. After you've had that first session and you decide, you go get Starbucks, you decide, okay, I think I can work with this person, go ahead and commit to a minimum of 10 sessions before you make any decisions or judgments about that person because it was Freud who first recognized that if therapy's working, there's gonna be resistance. And so resistance means that it comes out in some ways that are unconscious. I don't like this person anymore. I thought I did, but I don't, don't now. It's costing too much money. I don't really want to do the homework they're asking me to, to give. And so you're resisting the change that's happening. And if, if it's good therapy, change is happening. One of my mentors used to say, most people don't want to get well. They just want to feel better. Mm -hmm. Because getting well means making too many changes. And so I would say that you've got to have rapport so you can decide after that very first meeting, is this a person that I trust? And then you can stay with it for 10. After 10, then you can decide. It may not be working for you. 
it could be this isn't a good person. It could be that they, they don't relate as well or have the interventions that you wanted, right. and then it would be time to change. But I'll give you an example of this. I had a, a young lady one time that came and said, I understand you make referrals to other therapists. I need a referral. I've been with the same person for two years, and it's try, time to, for me to change. And I said, well, what is it about, what are they doing that makes you want to change? And they said, well, they never pray with me. And I said, so you want a therapist that'll pray with you? And they said, absolutely. And I said, well, what did your therapist say when you asked them to pray with you? And she said, well, I've never asked her to pray with me. She just doesn't. And I said, well, it's your therapy. You can ask for whatever you feel like you need. Let's do this. Before we go through this whole process of getting started all over again, go back, ask the question, will you pray with me? If they say no, call me. I'll make a referral. They never call back. So I'm guessing they're still together, <laughs> praying, having a good time with the Lord. But I think you have to be able also to ask for what you need. Yeah. Right. And remember, it's your therapy. If you're not getting what you want, ask for it. Now, the therapist can say, no, I don't do that, or I can't do that, or that's beyond my ability. But at least you're in charge of your own therapy, and so ask for what you need. That's good. That's good. Um, I, I've, I've received a couple of requests to say, keep going. This is really great. Okay. <laughs> so um, we're hearing that. Which, um, come back which by the way, back. we're, we're going to hang out afterwards, but mm -hmm. I think we could also maybe even record a couple of these and post them if you guys want to. Uh, yes. Send some in. We can, we can sit down and like release some of this later where you could like just listen to it uh, online. Yeah. Too, the so. great news is Ken does work here. Um, that's so right. that's helpful. We but, know where he lives. Well, I, I work pretty cheaply too, so that's <laughs> good. Good, good, yeah. yeah. We'll, buy, we'll buy you coffee. Um, <laughs> uh, so a few quick questions I think that are, that are really helpful. Um, when you're going through the process of reconciliation and this person doesn't feel that they were wrong, that they have done you wrong, that they need reconciliation here, uh, how do you find contentedness in that? And what are steps forward in that relationship? Yeah, remember this. You can do something about this. You may not be able to do anything about it. And you're only in charge of this, what you can do. You can't do anything about how they're going to respond to you or what they feel like that they're responsible for. They may continue till they die to say, I was innocent, had no part of that. I will tell you that if you feel, really feel like that person hurt you and that they were in the wrong and they're saying now that they never did anything wrong, they're not trustworthy. So at that point, I move on. Uh, I simply say that, okay, we can't be reconciled for that very reason. Let me move on to other relationships, and I won't continue to invest energy into this one, and we'll simply let that one go. Okay. And sometimes letting go can be the healthiest thing you can do. Release, I think, was pretty important. Don't hold on to it, though, in your mind with revenge one of the things that Mike and I talked about this afternoon is re revenge is an emotional black hole. You can never get enough. Uh, release, though, can give you a new perspective and a new energy for other relationships. Mm. That's good. That's really good. Um, one last one. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this one kind of sums up um, the, the theme of the series a little bit, talking about emotional resiliency. Um, what are some really practical ways uh, when you feel anxiety kind of bubbling up, things mm -hmm. taking a, stress, a stressful turn, an anxious turn, that you can cut that off at the pass and kind of move forward in a healthy way? That's a great question. So let me see if I'm understanding cl clearly. I'm feeling anxious. Yep. How do I stop that before it gets too much? Yes. Okay. That's a great question. First of all, know yourself well enough. Most of us have triggers and once you start getting to be stressed, if you'll recognize those triggers, you can intervene for yourself. Uh, a couple things I will tell you right now is uh, the best antidote for anxiety is structure. The more structure you have, the less anxiety you have. Any of y'all still in school? Do you, do you remember or, or have you experienced that very first day when you go into a new class and they give you the whole, everything that's going to be demanded of you and you walk out of that class thinking, I, I, I'll never, I'll never, I'm overwhelmed. I'll never make it. I might as well drop out today. But then you put together a structure. Here are all the things that are due. Here's my timeline. Here's what I got to do next. And the more structure you have, the less anxiety you have. Remember that? 
Do you remember how anxious you were the night before an exam and you never even started to prepare or the night before a paper? You didn't have any structure, so now you got anxiety. So the more structure you have, the, the less anxiety you're gonna have. I will tell you, if you can learn to breathe, you will learn to begin to bring those, those emotional triggers down. And if you can also begin to learn how to unwind yourself, the more anxious you are, the more you will literally physically somatize the anxiety like this. You have to set back your, your whole body. So put yourself back into a relaxed position and begin to breathe. We know that breathing makes a huge difference in terms of your anxiety. It brings your blood pressure down and it gives you new perspective. Just long term, real quickly, long term, the best uh, mood manager you have is sleep. Uh, I'm sounding like your mother now, no, but uh, you need for your age between seven and nine hours of sleep every night, and the key to healthy sleeping is rhythm. The circadian rhythm is really a good thing. Now, I have a 24-year-old who thinks that you can stay up all week and then sleep on the weekends. That, well, you can sleep all, gosh, she, she can sleep all week, but that is not a mental health practice. Okay, what you want to do for your mental health and for your anxiety is get into a regular rhythm of sleep. That will manage your mood just about as well as anything. Second thing is, again, I'm sounding like your mama, exercise. Uh, if you can do something as simple as walk in the afternoon, take the dog out for a walk. Uh, if you can go to the gym, that's great. But you don't have to. Come to the church and walk. Do something to move. The movement will also be a huge uh, there, there are several brain hormones that we're talking about. The, the mood manager, serotonin, uh, the, the thing that also the exercise does, it activates a, uh, uh, a hormone called norepinephrine. That's also a mood manager, much like serotonin, and dopamine. Dopamine's your feel good. So if you can do that, you can make a huge difference in terms of the stress you're feeling. Mm. So go sleep and then get some exercise. And that, put your schedules together and follow your schedule. That does sound like mom. But it's good advice. That's awesome. Well, mother was wise for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> and we didn't uh, listen to mother, but, and you won't listen to me, but there's a reason. Yeah. Now, a lot of this, mother never knew, but a lot of this is evidence-based now. We now know it works, and that's why mother used to say it. I haven't even talked about healthy eating. That's another one, that's, but we won't so go there tonight. Eat your vegetables. That does sound like mom. Eat your vegetables, go to sleep, work out. Potato Done. chip is not a vegetable. I know that some of Man. you are convinced that potato chips are vegetables, yeah. but that is not a yeah. vegetable. All right. That well, is, doesn't count in my vegetable group. Well, y'all, um, we, we would love to continue the conversation. We'll be down here up front. We also would love to continue taking some of these questions. So the number's still on the screen. If you have questions, if you even want to go a step further and go deeper, we are here for it. And uh, we would love to even maybe record answers to some of these, post them online, because this is the good stuff, talking through the, the issues of the heart, how we can be resilient, how we can walk through some of these things. So would you guys thank Dr. Ken with me? By the way, it's still raining outside. If you want to hang around, just hang out in here. That'd be the thing you, to do. That's right. All right. So um, as we close out, I just want to take us through uh, 120 seconds. 120 seconds for us is just a moment to kind of reflect on everything we've heard and everything we've kind of walked through. Uh, a moment for us to just not just skate past everything we've kind of been processing tonight. Uh, and so our team's coming up. We're going to do a, a little bit of worship uh, as well on the back end here. But 120 seconds for us is an important time because we're able to sit in the moment. And uh, on every one of your chairs, there's one of these cards. These are, these are things we call prayer tags here. Uh, it's a way for you to put a prayer request in, and we do this every week. Uh, and you can put these in uh, one of the boxes when you leave, if you wanna leave a prayer request. But as we do this 120 seconds, I thought something we could do just for us, for our own story, not, it doesn't have to be for anybody else, but really just for us, uh, is to think about, um, Forgiveness as an idea. You know, the story we just saw tonight, the story of Joseph, is filled with hurt people who have to process how to move forward. And I know that I'm one of those people that have moments in my life where I wish I could have done things different. 
I have moments in my life where I've had people say or do things to me that, that have continued to hurt. And to be honest, like sometimes it's like, man, I just want to have revenge on that person. I just start thinking about it. But really, God's calling me to release them. Because the only person who suffers when I have revenge in my heart is myself. And some of us in this room, when we hear about Jesus offering us forgiveness, we think that that can't possibly be true because what we've done is something that we have let define us and we're not sure if anybody would ever forgive somebody like that. So as we take this time to sit and reflect, I want you to take this card, actually look at it, and just think about the name of somebody that you might want to release tonight. Maybe there's somebody from way back in your past who said something that made you feel inferior or unseen or unlovable, and you've been carrying that pain to this day. Maybe it's somebody who is really close to you, like a parent. Maybe it's even God. You, deep down, are really carrying a weight that says, hey, God has abandoned you. Tonight you need to release it. Maybe it's even your, yourself. The person you can't forgive is you. So whoever the name it is that you need to write down, my invitation for you tonight is to do that. To take the time and release them. And in doing so, you're going to find freedom.